You are now listening to The Real Health Podcast with Dr. Taylor Crick. In today's episode, Dr. Taylor interviews Dr. Sue McDonald. This episode has been sponsored by realhealthresource.com, your go-to resource for everything health, nutrition, and wellness. Be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and of course, please visit our website at realhealthresource.com. All right, welcome to a Real Health Podcast interview, and I'm very excited about today's interview. I'm here with uh, my friend and patient, Dr. Susan McDonald. And Dr. Susan, Dr. McDonald, is a veterinarian. Um, And so we have had just some fascinating conversations in the office about health of animals um, and just how it relates to, to the health of humans. And so Dr. McDonald and I share a lot of the same health views. We follow a lot of the same people. She's very knowledgeable on, on natural uh, modalities for your health and, and diet, exercise, nutrition, um, supplementation. She's very, very knowledgeable. And obviously, as a, as a doctor, you understand the physiology of it as well. Uh, so I'm very excited to interview you. So welcome, Dr. McDonald. Thank you. Uh, So, you know, first off, just along those lines, we have a lot of the same health interests. You know, we watch a lot of the same docu-series, the the Truth About Cancer, the the Betrayal series about autoimmune disease. Who are some of your favorite people out there, other than the Real Health Podcast, to to follow or that you like to listen to? Is there anybody that comes to mind? Um. Most of the things I get are Dr. Mercola. Oh yeah, like my absolute favorite. And Dr. Mercola talks yeah. touches on on animals quite a bit. He uh, does, and Dr. Karen Becker is his colleague in the animal side. Okay. So I follow a lot of her stuff and read things, and I have a lot of patients and clients who follow her too. Okay. So she sort of melts with Dr. Mercola and his thinking, and then of course he always tells us about all these other doc- documentaries that we watch and. And I really like uh, the Truth About Cancer series and yeah. all the stuff that Ty Bollinger does. So. Okay, and yeah, and that, he, I he love, brings in. I, I love, you know, when these things come out, you know, we always, uh, you'll say, are you watching this one? I'll yeah. say, yeah. Are you, oh, yeah. Are you watching this one? <laughs> say, yeah, I bought it. It's, uh, it's, I can catch up on it. And so, yeah, we uh, sh- share a lot of the same thinking patterns there. So how long have you been a veterinarian? So I've been in practice 32 years. Okay. Um, and... Graduated in 80, January of 84 at Colorado State. And I've been. Do you, do you know that? Well, first off, that's where. That's my undergrad. Oh, Colorado good State. Yeah, that's, <laughs> Yay. that's my undergrad, my uh-huh. alma mater. But also, that's the year I was born. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for letting me know. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, two coincidences. Yeah. But, but no, but I think that that's, you know, part of the, the fascinating things about our, our conversations is that. And that's what we're going to get into are the changes that you've seen, you know, over the past 30 years with with animals and with their health. And I think that this is fascinating, too, before we get into it, because, you know, it's it's just science. It's just anatomy and physiology. Right. And animals, they can't tell us what their complaints are. They can't say, oh, I hurt here. They can't say, oh, I want a quick fix. Uh, you know, give me the aspirin, the Aleve, the, the you know, pharmaceutical drug. They, you know, their owners have to notice a symptomatic problem or bring them in for a well checkup and you just, you find it. But it's not based on their, their symptoms or their complaints. It's more just based on the anatomy and the physiology of what's, what's going on in their bodies. Right. So what changes have you seen in the, in the past decades? Or if you start back, you know, when you, when you graduated, tell me about the health of animals then versus now and, and kind of the increased prevalence of some of the same chronic diseases that we see in humans. You know, we've talked about chronic inflammatory conditions. We've talked about autoimmune conditions in animals, thyroid conditions. So tell us a little bit about what you've seen in practice. So, and, and I know <clears throat> years ago we didn't have the diagnostic abilities that we have now, but I still can look back and say, well, I never found a cat that had diabetes in maybe two a year. Um, We never had a cancer patient, except uh, very rarely or infrequently. Our biggest concerns back in the 30 years ago were things like chronic kidney disease, aging problems in pets, Um, but we also didn't get trained in nutrition at that school. The training I got in nutrition was from 
the pet food companies. They're the ones that trained us in nutrition. Okay. And so that was the, that's been the main thrust of nutrition in animal health is the pet food companies. So it's a lot like the um, human manufacturers food companies. You know, yeah, that's or, what the food is being made, it's processed, it's put together with vitamins and minerals and balance, but it's also got the things in it that now we're recognizing over the years has really started to accumulate into chronic disease for animals. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, cancers and autoimmune diseases and infl chronic inflammatory disease and obesity, diabetes, um, they're as rampant in animals as they are in people now. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I think that one thing that sounds like to me is it sounds like doctors or physicians being educated by pharmaceutical reps. They're educated by, by, you know, a, a company that's, when you think about it, yes, they're in the, the market of, uh, or, or, yeah, at least claim to be in the market of well-being, but at the same time, it is a business, it is a company, so their number one goal is to keep costs low. So as they, you know, through the years, I'm sure you've seen, they add lower quality ingredients, foods that are, you know, maybe just less quality because it cuts costs, but their long-term effects of that. Um, tell me about, like we've talked about, especially when GMO foods were introduced uh, into, into animal food. Right. Tell me about what you've seen since then. So the biggest, the biggest controversy I think in pet food has been grains and corn. So mm -hmm. years ago, Science Diet, one of the best companies out there for research, um, started putting corn in their diet. So corn is the number one GMO food mm -hmm. out there. I mean, um, and so you know they're not getting organic corn to put in these foods. They're getting the cheap corn that's all GMO grown. So in those, what, 20 some years since we've really seen the GMO foods produced, um, I could say that cancer has increased in a pet population to now I, one in one and two probably. One and two, wow. Yeah, I see Which is you know close to young pets. Uh, that's you know uh, close to human Yeah, rates. it's one and two in men, one in three in women. Right. Averages to be about forty one percent overall. Uh, that's shocking. And all kinds of cancers. I mean, um, really uh, I, we lost a dog, I was just talking to the owner yesterday, that was five years old. A five year old um, German wire hair pointer that had um, melanoma throughout his body, like stage four melanoma, and it started on a toe. So those are really weird cancers for mm -hmm. dogs to be picking up at that young of an age. We see a lot of lymphomas in young dogs, very uh, osteosarcomas, um, just a lot of cancer of any kind. So it depends on the individual as to where that cancer is going to develop, just yeah. like in humans. But, uh, but, but I definitely am seeing that change. And I think that's interesting too because, you know, I'd say the general population, if they hear melanoma, they think, oh, the, the dog wasn't wearing sunscreen, right? Right, and yeah. but that's not really, you know, we have a blog article about about the links or the lack of links between sun exposure and, and cancer. And in fact, sun exposure boosts vitamin D, which actually helps reduce cancer risks. Uh, so that's a very interesting one that you mentioned that yeah. melanoma being seen in dogs. I, I think that an interesting thing too is you know GMOs. They haven't been around for very long. This is a, a biotech, you know, invention. And in case you know you're not familiar, a genetically modified organism is a food that they have taken genes out and put other genes in to basically change the food, to change its resistance. You know, most of it is is Roundup resistant corn, uh, soybeans, cotton. Those are some of the biggest GMO uh, beets. Um, so, so that's genetically modified foods. But one of the interesting things is, you know, because it was a newer invention, they were introduced into humans and animals at the same time. But as we know, animals age faster. That's why, you know, we have doggy years. So would you say that this could be a sign of, of what's coming or what's, I mean, what's already happening in humans? Do you think so? I think so, yeah. I think it's really scary, and the, and it's not just the product of the um, corn itself with the genetically engineered uh, genes in it. It's the fact that those crops are usually sprayed with glyphosate, and that's yeah. the big issue. Is that stuff is 
poisoning the world. Yeah. And um, a lot of rat studies have proven that, of course, their lifespans three, four years, and they'll get tumors by two years of age, huge, ugly tumors. Yeah, yeah, if you're listening to this, you know, go to Google, type in GMO rat tumors, and you can see the photos. I mean, it's, you know, it's like a you know, big golf ball size, baseball size tumors in these rats. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a good thing to touch on is that it's not only the, the GMOs, but it's the glyphosate that they're spraying on it. So glyphosate is the active ingredient in Roundup. And I don't have the stats in front of me right now, but it's linked to a lot of different chronic conditions today. Uh, inflammatory bowel disease being a big one, celiac disease, uh, all, all kinds of things that glyphosate does. It can actually help uh, trans transport things across the blood-brain barrier, which otherwise wouldn't get across the blood-brain barrier. And a lot of the best research on glyphosate is coming out of MIT, um, and it's pretty cut and dry, pretty clear. They just did MIT, uh, uh, Dr. Samsel there just did a study where he tested all the vaccines that are on the market uh, for, for kids and adults, including the flu vaccines, and I, and I think all but two tested positive for at least trace amounts of glyphosate. And they estimate that it's because it's in the bones of animals, and then they use you know gelatin products in some ways uh, for for the so it's not directly Cell lines. yeah it's not in the uh, it's not like one of the ingredients but because the world is basically tainted with glyphosate now you know they found it in the majority of organic foods even now they can find trace amounts of glyphosate uh, that's that's really shocking mm -hmm. so let, let's talk about you know what can people do I mean for their pets you know mm -hmm. and, and it's probably the same thing that they can do for themselves you know listen to this podcast find out ways that you can avoid these things and, and actually that I do want to touch on that but along the lines of glyphosate what do you think about other household toxins or other environmental toxins do you think that that's playing a big role in the increase in this chronic disease problem uh, in pets and, and in humans yeah, absolutely. Uh, and the fact that you've got all these toxins in your home and pets are smaller and closer to the floor, just like babies crawling around on the floor, yeah. they're going to pick up the carpets and the paint fumes and the the toxins of cleaning, the clean, the floor cleaning yeah, stuff. Yeah, under the sink. They're going to drink out of the toilet bowl, which is going to be full of toxins. you got to watch everything you do. We do see a lot of poisonings in dogs. Um, just because they get into things they shouldn't, yeah. um, chemicals and, and toxins in the home. But there's well-meaning, very clean people that are cleaning their home with all these toxic chemicals that are exposing pets and themselves to these. And so I think um, a lot of the things you can do is to look into more natural cleaning, look into essential oils and the way they can clean and disinfect. They're not going to be toxic. If you are toxic to cats, just be careful and check with a qualified veterinarian if you use oils in cats um, or look online. There's lots of resources, but basically those are very safe to add to cleaners, to use as cleaners. You just clean out the the main chemicals and toxins that we spray in our houses all the time. Yeah, and we always talk about that, you know, your body is a bucket, right, and yeah. it fills with toxins. And so in today's society, we can't avoid them all, but there are lots of steps that you can do to minimize how quickly you're filling that bucket. And we also talk about, you know, if I'm a bucket, uh, a newborn baby is more like a, a solo cup or a shot glass. You know, they're, a small bucket can fill quickly, and I'd say the same thing with, the with pets. pets. Yeah. yeah. So right. smaller, smaller, you know, just body mass you know, accumulates toxins at a faster rate. I think it's really interesting what you mentioned about just being close to the ground and the carpets and the beddings, and, and a lot of people aren't aware of all the toxins that are in there. You know, uh, formaldehyde, I think Lumber Liquidators is going through a big thing with their flooring right now because heavy in formaldehyde, carpets, carpet glues, heavy in xylenes, heavy in different toxins, and all these things, you know, I always am, am careful to say that this isn't a doomsday podcast, but you have to know, you have to be educated, and you have to take steps to minimize your exposures for you, for your babies crawling around, and for your pets crawling around. I think that that's a, a, an important thing to touch on.
So what are some, some recommendations that you have outside of you know, the cleaning supplies? That's a great one, by the way, so thank you for that. But what are some things that, that people can do to keep their pets as healthy as possible? What should they be eating? What are some, some brands maybe that you recommend or just some, some natural foods for, for pets? Okay, so I think the biggest thing would be to don't fall into this give them the grains are fine and don't worry about feeding them grains. I really don't think they're good for us either. I think they do cause leaky gut in animals. They turn to sugar. Um, there's just, I just would avoid foods with grains and that, you're, a lot of vets will say, oh that's hogwash, but it is not. Uh, I really think that's true. So um, a, a food without grains would be the best. Organic would be the best. I don't have any recommendations for brands but definitely any organic food yeah. that's really um, grain free um, and basically as cruelty free as possible for the it's yeah. just hard to find pet foods that are like grass fed and free range poultry and that sort of thing uh, but you can get organic there are good, good organic foods out there so definitely avoid uh, foods with grains if you wanted to do a home cooked food that would be ideal I don't have time to do that, so I do the best I can with the sure. products I have to buy, but people do want to do that. Um, and there are websites that you can use to balance that food, because you can't just cook any meal and give it to your dog, just like us. We don't balance our diets very well, mm -hmm. and we're not going to be able to balance theirs. And there is an advantage to using a commercial dog food, is that they are going to be a balanced and complete food. So they're going to have the vitamins and minerals that you need. Uh, so I'd say at least keep three quarters of their diet into um, a balanced, complete food that's grain free and as organic as you can get. And then you can add fresh foods to their diet. You can add um, vegetables. Dogs are big vegetable eaters. Dogs are, yeah. are not obligate carnivores. Cats are obligate carnivores. Cats. Okay. Dogs are more like us. They could be... Um, they're omnivorous, they could be vegetarian. Physiologically, they could survive as a vegetarian. It's not ideal. Like a human. Um, but yeah, like a human. Um, so, um, but basically, your cats are gonna have to have your the meats. And cats aren't really great at wanting treats anyway. Some cats do love a little bit of meat or tuna or something. Uh, so fresh vegetables um, and fresh meats um, cooked for them or lightly cooked so that you can decrease the bacterial contamination that comes with all of our meats. Um, unless you're on a farm and you can kill them yourself and bring it to them right then. Um, those would be the best things to, to supplement. So one quarter of their food and that kind of whole food supplements, real food, living food, um, and then three quarters in a balanced diet. And that'll keep them pretty balanced, but make sure that's an organic grain-free diet. That would be my best suggestion for uh, most people that's easiest for them. Okay, well, I love that. I love that you mentioned grain-free because that's a big passion of mine, that just educating people on, on the dangers of, of eating grains. The more I learn about the people side of it, the more I think about what's going on the pet side, and I think it's identical. Yeah. The leaky gut and all the toxins and all the inflammation that comes in from the leaky gut, and dogs definitely are getting that, cats too are getting that. Yeah, and you see it, you know, especially in, in cattle, you know, you don't think of cattle necessarily as pets, but it's the same same thing, but they feed them grains, they get fatter quicker, and that is good for a farmer. You know, we always talk about that's good for a farmer. A, a fat cow makes more money and yield mm -hmm. for the farmer, but they get sicker quicker. Mm -hmm. So they have to feed them antibiotics. You know, 70% of our antibiotics are used in our livestock. Right. They have to feed them hormones to just keep them alive and keep them healthy and well until they get to the slaughter. Which uh, is not only cruel, I mean it's really cruel the way we raise our food animals yeah. and, and the fact that um, we're making them sick by the way we feed them and then we have to fill them full of all these drugs and there's so many regulations for food animal vets that they have to bring them off these drugs so many days, months before slaughter, um, you, they have to really regulate that. And that's because that stuff's not good for us. We shouldn't be eating it. Yeah. It's going to be in their systems. But, and for me, for me in my heart, it's like I, I can't support what's going on in the confined animal feeding operations. Right. It, it's horribly cruel. 
very painful for the animals to live in that situation. Yeah. And so the, when I choose to buy meat, it's when I know it's been grass-fed and, and humanely raised. Yeah. That's just my heart. It's, well, I'm glad you shared that. The other thing that I thought was just fascinating was, you know, I, I really didn't know that much about what animals, you know, what, what is the best diet for them. You know, I grew up with just conventional dog food for our dog. Yeah. But I, I, I've told you recently we have a friend who their dog uh, lost a leg to cancer. I, I don't know what kind of cancer, my guess would be an osteosarcoma. Yeah. But now uh, the dog eats better than, than most humans. And, and the, uh, we were at their house recently in Denver and they were feeding carrots and, and you know, raw fresh vegetables and just such a great diet. And, yeah. But then uh, when you talked about cats, how they, they do need meat, I thought about, okay, well what's a cat's natural diet, cat's natural environment? And the one thing you think about a cat chasing is a mouse. Right. And so that's probably their natural diet. It is, would be you know, great small if we can mice for them. <laughs> <laughs> but and there's plenty of mice, so why right? aren't they doing yeah, that? Yeah. It's gross. <laughs> but you know, that would be their best diet. Yeah, yeah that's okay. a mouse. Awesome. Yeah. So and cats, if we can skip to cats real quickly, yeah. I don't like dry food for cats. Um, we like canned food, and the reason is it's more mouse-like, so it's 70% water, which is a mouse body. It's higher in protein, it's, and it's very low in carbohydrates. Um, so all the canned foods are more appropriate for cats. So if you're going to have to feed a commercial food to your cat, I know it's not as convenient, but cats do way better. It's more metabolically normal for them to eat more of a canned food. Uh, for the higher protein, lower carb, and higher moisture content. Okay. So well, cats, dry food's like their worst enemy. Okay. Well, I'm glad you added that in. Well, I hope that everybody listening, you know, finds this as fascinating as I do because I know how much people just love and care about their pets and they want them to live as long and as healthy as possible. But at the same time, I hope that you're seeing the parallels between your own family. You know, one of the things that I've seen before is, is people that treat their pets better than they treat themselves. And, and I don't think that it should be one better than the other, but this is how we should all be living, be eating, be feeding our children, and be feeding our, our pets and animals as well. Because we love them and we care about them and we want them to live a, as long and healthy of a life as possible. So thank you very much, Dr. McDonald. This thank has been fascinating. You. I hope everybody can take something from that. Yeah, I definitely think that they will. Uh, so once again, this is the Real Health Podcast with Dr. Susan McDonald and Dr. Taylor Crick. Uh, and make sure you tune in next time. We'll bring you another fascinating topic. Thank you for listening to the Real Health Podcast with Dr. Taylor Crick. This episode has been sponsored by realhealthresource.com, your go-to resource for everything health, nutrition, and wellness. Be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and of course, please visit our website at realhealthresource.com.